Hi, my name is Gerdy Verwoerd and you're listening to Daring Self Leadership and the Nature Connection. Joe Roberts is a writer living in Cumbria with a fabulous dog Millie. She believes that words and nature have the healing power to transform inner thoughts, feelings and emotions. And that a blank page has the magical potential to dance with innate creativity. Writing Inside Out is her new venture to inspire and motivate others to explore and share their own stories. Jo believes that we all have a story to tell and that experiencing life's ups and downs is a journey we all travel. She understands though that while sharing can be a joyful liberation, it can also be a daunting and scary place. That to show up at our most vulnerable and reveal ourselves takes courage. So her mission is to gently encourage and empower amazing souls who have a story to tell, to write inside out. Originally from southwest England, she is now settled on the edge of the beautiful Lake District National Park, where her writing, like her life, reflects some deep inner shifts. In her former career, she has been leading and facilitating groups within an outdoor and adventure setting for decades. So she's well versed in holding space and going the extra mile. Jo finds great solace being near the mountains and when she's not writing, coaching or leading others, she can be found enjoying the healing power of open water swimming, strolling through the woods or striding out on the local fells. Let's dive into my conversation with Jo Roberts. Jo, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm really glad you're here. So, I've been going over your bio and your website and everything and... um, you have been in the outdoor space for a long time. You're now a writer and you do uh, writing workshops and everything. But you went, I know you went to university because you got introduced to me by Leslie Roberts, no family. Yes. Um, and you met at university. So the usual path, usual in quotes, the usual path for people who go to university is to go into serious quotes. Um, career and you chose to go into the outdoor space yes which a lot of people would say why are you wasting your university <laughs> education on the outdoor space now I can understand it but I can I also understand why a lot of people would think oh that's a total waste why did the woman do that and I think it's a sign of self-leadership if ever there was one okay that's interesting <laughs> Yeah, so tell me what happened there. So um, the outdoors was in, is, was in me well before I even went to university. So I I was always outdoorsy as a child, just like loved being outdoors, and it was just a part of me. And I'd already discovered rock climbing when I was a teenager. So and I I was involved in in the Venture Scouts and things like that. And uh, so went to university because that was. To be honest, the school I went to, it was a state state school in, in the UK. But if if they thought you were capable of going to university, they that was your pathway. That was the kind of that was what you had to, not had to do, but you weren't really given many other choices. Um like apprentice apprenticeships and things like that didn't really you weren't told about those when when I was at school. So it was it was all it was assumed you'd go to university if you could. Mm. So I did. Um but I really wanted to do an outdoor course. And, uh, and ended up um, for a whole variety of reasons in Bedford. And I think one of the ma- most reasons for being there was the friends that I met because mm. Bedford in the UK is very flat. There's no mountains, there's no hills. Um, but I went and, uh, yes, yeah, made some amazing friends. And I, massive part of that for me was joining the, they call it the mountaineering club. So we went climbing and walking and various bits and pieces. And I just carried on doing all the outdoor stuff. So I, I started kayaking as well and I had a whole variety of things. And then it came to sort of the the third year, and there was bits of my course were to do with were to do with the outdoors, but bits of it weren't. It was an environment and leisure studies course, and I just decided. Well, I didn't decide. It was in me. It was it was it was a natural, totally natural progression to to go and um, apply to outdoor centres for work experience, and then from the work experience came came the paid work when I finished when I finished. But originally, because I'd done an environmental studies degree, I actually applied to be uh, an environmental studies tutor at an outdoor centre. Mm. And they basically turned around and it's quite funny, I think, looking back on it. And they said, oh, we haven't got many female outdoor um, instructors. 
would you consider applying for the outdoor outdoor instructor job rather than the environmental tutor? And it didn't, you know, either one was good for me. I mean, to be honest, I got less money doing the outdoor one. But at that time, first job out of uni, and I wasn't, I've never been bothered by high sort of high careers and things like that. It's just not been, it's not been, it's not been in me. Mm. And um, so I was like, yeah, okay, if you're going to offer me a job, I'll do that. So I did the outdoor one rather than the environmental one. And looking back on it, that was the, that was the catalyst then for, for doing all the outdoor things. And I already had a few sort of um, trainings and qualifications and things by then for the outdoor work anyway. So mm. it, it really was a natural progression. So it was never an active decision to go against the grain. I just think that I was never in the grain. <laughs> so I was, I was <laughs> already not in it, if that makes sense. Yeah, so, it does. Yeah. It does. It's sort of, um, it's almost like if you're into the universe and the universe steering our lives, it's mm-hmm. like the universe put you on a path where it's like, you, you know, you can go to university, but really, Joe, mm-hmm. this is the path that you're destined yes. to go on. Yeah. I really think that I went because for the friends I've met, like the friends I made are still my, you know, really good friends now, best friends now, really. And, and the fact that it gave me a degree and, and having a degree opened up doors. It didn't, it didn't necessarily need to be that I had a degree, but on paper, having a degree opened up some doors later on for the different things that I've done. Mm-hmm. So various things like teacher training and things like that which I've subsequently done I had to have the degree in the first place I didn't know any of that at the time I was just doing each you know each step that felt right yeah Um, but then I've I guess you then look at what you've got and what you can what you can build on and and that's kind of what I've done so yeah how did the people around you react when you chose a career path that was not necessarily a logical one after you studied at uni oh that's a really good question I think they just I think it was very normal for that I I think they I don't think there was any reaction I'm trying to think now not many people in my family have been to university so I don't come from a background where people are doing university degrees and then going on to the university type work if that Mm -hmm. makes sense Mm -hmm. so I think they were just happy I was doing what I wanted to do I was very lucky in that respect so my dad my dad had become self-employed when I was 12 so I had that as a as a role model I guess Mm -hmm. and um I don't remember there being any there was no pressure there's I've never been given any pressure to have to perform in a certain way really lucky so um, I can sometimes, I guess, maybe not being pushed enough, maybe people might say, you know, obviously sometimes you need that push, but, but I, I don't remember anybody, one person, one person I'm thinking now, my auntie Kathleen, who is long gone now, she, she was a, a very dear friend of the family, but we called her auntie. And she was always, always, always telling me, when are you going to get a proper job? When are you going to get a proper job? When are you going to get a proper job? And she kept saying that for years when I was in the outdoor industry. Mm. So she was the only one out of my whole family who ever verbalized anything. I've no idea if anybody else thought it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think my, my parents were happy enough that I was doing something I enjoyed. Yeah. I don't think they, 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 I certainly wasn't, um, going against the grain for them. I was doing, I think it was a natural step from what they'd seen me doing already. And I was already sort of quite outdoorsy and adventurous and things. So yeah, I think for them it was, yeah, it was a natural step. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, when, and you're right, uh, when you're saying you're quite lucky because, uh, I know lots of people and I'm one of them mm-hmm. who, um, grew up in a, in a family where, People were like, parents were like, you know, if, if you can and when you can, when you're smart enough, mm-hmm. you know, keep studying because a good degree means a good job mm-hmm. and a good job means a good pension and a good pension means a good life. Uh, yeah. Um, and one of the things when I told my parents after a career in a consultancy or whatever, um, that I was going to sell my house and I was going to move to Austria and I was going to become a, um, mountain hiking guide and do some other stuff to make sure that I wouldn't die, you know, or, mm-hmm. you know, in the gutter somewhere. Um, my thought, the first thing my dad said was, what about your pension? Wow. And my mom gave him a shake and was like, if she wants to do this because she wants to be happy, why can't you be happy for her? Yes. Yeah. But my, you know, that, my dad's question, my dad never calls me. You know, it's typical dad is his generation is mm-hmm. like, you know, the women in the family maintain contact with other yeah. family members, even with my kids. 
uh, I, so when he called a couple of years ago, I, I think I must have been living here something like two years or so. He called and he was like, I'm thinking about you. And I'm like, oh, my God, what happened to mom? <laughs> oh. <laughs> because he's calling. Mm-hmm. And, um, and no, 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 I'm thinking about you. I'm reading something. I'm like, what are you reading, Dad? And he's like, oh, I'm reading about pensions. How is it, what, What's happening with yours? Oh, wow. He, you know, so worried about what might happen in the future and, yeah. um, and that you have to take care of these things. And I'm not saying that's wrong. It's just mm-hmm. not necessarily, you know, I lived that life for 20 mm-hmm. plus years and I wasn't very happy doing it. So I decided to change. I'd sort of, I did what you did when you came out of uni. And, you know, I did it when I had, in my, when I was in my forties and I uh, decided to change my path to life. So, yeah, I think you're very lucky when you have parents who, are like, I just want my kid to be happy. Mm-hmm. And I don't want him to die in the gutter. You know, I don't want him to be go to be destitute somewhere out on the streets, but I want them to be happy and doing whatever it is that makes mm-hmm. them happy instead of you have to go to, you know, study at the highest level you possibly can and get a good job and a safe job and whatever else. So yeah. Yeah. It's really lucky. Yeah, I think definitely the, no, the flip side of having chosen the the working life that I've chosen mm. is, of course, that I don't have a pension. <laughs> I, yeah, I, no, have that, a pension. It, I know because <laughs> I've been living that life for the last eleven. You know, I've been living that life for the last eleven years, and I had to laugh when my dad asked me that because I was like, I can't afford to <laughs> to buy a pension right now. Yeah. You know, I'm paying my taxes, and part of those taxes go towards a minimum pension, and that's it. Yeah, yeah so, and, it, and it is definitely a. Um, you know, I've had people, I've worked in outdoor centres, I mean, beautiful, beautiful old buildings in amazing places. And I've had people, and I've worked with corporate people as well as, as mm. children, all sorts of people. And I had one particular, um, I was working with some apprentices and I had, um, their, their manager came from, from somewhere else in England and it was in the Lake District. And he just said, wow, you're so lucky to sort of, to, to live here. And it was this amazing, great big mansion building in these wonderful grounds in the middle of the Lake District. And I was like, I think he genuinely thought I lived in this place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, no, I'm just working here. Like I live in a, you know, an old little mining town up in the North Cumbria. It's like, it's not the actual Lake District. And, um, and it was quite funny that he, his assumption was that I had all these lovely trappings of a corporate job. Um, but that I was living it, I was working in the outdoors and, <clears throat> and it's very different. So yeah. that the, I have the, the whole outdoor side of it, but the, some of the the fallbacks the financial fallbacks or the support fallbacks with the corporate world I've never had so Mm. it is it's definitely a trade-off but I am I wouldn't have changed my my choices you know certainly when I was younger I think it was really important for me to to do the things that that I just felt not that I wanted to do I just felt drawn to do it they were the natural things for me to do Mm. I wouldn't have been you know if I'd been if I'd been sort of shoehorned into um, a more restrictive job. I, I, not, well, I'm not sure what would have happened. I looked at the army actually. I did look at the army and, um, and then I realized on, um, let's say ethical grounds, but just on a variety of things when I really looked at my values and I really looked at what was the things that drove me. It was, I was really, really attracted to the out, to the army lifestyle. Yeah. But the whole purpose of the army, I just couldn't get my head around. So in the end, uh, I went through the first, um, you know, selection process for was officer training, actually. So that would have been mm. a very different, different mm. life. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then I, I got through that first bit and I got accepted for the second bit of, of, um, the process. And by that point, I was li- living and working up in Scotland. And, uh, and I think the interviews were down in Wiltshire and I was like, no, this isn't, this isn't for me anymore. So mm. I, I pulled out. So that was yeah. interesting as to where yeah. that life would have led had I have actually, you know, chosen to take it. But, yeah. yeah. That's so funny. There's so many parallels. I didn't know that about you because I was drawn to the military as well because of the adventure aspect of it. Yeah. And the outdoor and, um, you know, and I grew, I'm, I think I'm older than, I am, I am older than you. Um, so I grew up in the, in the Cold War era where, you know, okay. the, the, the threat of a nuclear war was very much on any military person's mind. Mm-hmm. And I remember the question, uh, something along the lines of what will you do when an officer tells you to press, to, you know, to fire off a nuclear weapon? And I was like, I'll ask him if he's sure, you know, why are we doing this? Which is, of <laughs> yeah. course, not the right kind of answer. Yeah. Suffice it to say, I didn't get it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, isn't it? That different parallel life that we could have had, but for the decisions. And that was an active decision for me, that mm. there's been, sometimes in life things happen where they are, 
you look back and you realize it's a series of events, maybe serendipity, maybe fate, who yeah. knows. But mm. then there's other things that are active worldly choices that I've made. And, and that was one of them, Des- deciding to apply and then deciding to, to withdraw yeah. my, my the process. So, yeah. 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 Anyways. So going back to the outdoor, uh, mm-hmm. outdoors, uh, life, uh, instructor life, um, there's lots of leadership lessons that people, um, run into when they, you know, they do an outdoor course or when com- and companies come to uh, th- those kinds of centers almost to learn those lessons. What yes. are some of the biggest lessons that you have been able to teach people, maybe have learned yourself or see people yeah. learn? So I think the biggest thing there is probably the fact that I, I am technically a teacher, but I would say that I'm much more facilitator. So mm-hmm. when people have come to outdoor centers, they, some things we're teaching them, of course, like some of the actual skills stuff they might need, but the, the actual, I think where the, the real value in it lies is, is the, is things that they, they learn for themselves. And often those can be things like committing to something. Or it can be like the decision making, all the kind of, I guess, the, the typical kind of jargon things, but also just that sense that each person does have an important role to play. So if mm. there are, if there's a group of people, so we would typically be taking people out and, and doing, um, you know, expeditions. So we'd have, we'd have teenagers initially, and then I'd work with adults and you'd be going out for, you know, as a minimum one night and some groups I've worked with have been multiple, multiple nights. And it's that sense that if they're not organized, if they're not looking out for each other, if they're not, um, you know, thinking about the bigger picture, mm-hmm. it's those types of things that I think people value from, as well as that extra kind of element of, of magic, really, just from being outdoors and being away. So although the outdoors has always been a part of my life, yeah. I'm really aware that a lot of the people I work with or, or did work with, when they're coming to outdoor centers, it isn't necessarily a massive part of their life. So actually sort of what can seem seemingly small experiences to an outdoor instructor who's been doing it for years mm. can be really impacting and, and pa- empowering for, for an individual coming. So it isn't necessarily what we teach. It's more um, the different things that each individual takes away from the experience and and one thing I did notice particularly working with groups that I had for for a week or, or more so some groups will come for less than a week but often mm-hmm. they come for a week or more and and you can see the whole this trust the process thing and actually I do use this in my writing now as well when I'm coaching writers and it's that trust in the process that you get from the start you might have people that in an outdoor setting aren't really sure why they're there, don't want to be there, have been sent there maybe, maybe it's the boss that sent them or maybe the school teachers or the parents or somebody sent them. Mm-hmm. And it's that sense that, and you see people going through all these stressful situations and, and actually sometimes being really anti us as instructors as well sometimes yeah. they just don't want to be in that situation. And then eventually, and we're doing, especially when it's, it's overt personal development or professional development where the onus is on people to take responsibility for what they're doing. They're not just being led directly from the front. They are being sort of facilitated and encouraged and supported to lead themselves. And then often you see that process where somebody just doesn't get it at the start and they still don't get it in the middle and they're still like causing havoc for everybody. And then by the end of the week, they're like, they suddenly get it and something Mm. sort of switches into place. It can be different for each person as to what switches into place. But that that's kind of some of the most um, amazing times. And you really think that that person, (coughs) excuse me, has has really learned something really beneficial for themselves as a person. And Mm. it isn't necessarily how to how to coil a rope or or how to put up a tent or how to use a stove to cook. It's 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 bigger than that, but they are the actual skills they're learning. But actually they're they're learning a lot more about life and how to get on with people and more about themselves and where their own limits are and where their own poten- potentials are as well. So you have a good example of that as you can il- il- use to illustrate that. Um there are so so many, so many different yes. examples I could yeah. use. I'm thinking of one particular centre that I worked at. Again, this happened through the Lake District, and I was I was an associate instructor there, so I wasn't there all the time. This was a few years back now, and I had one 
particular young man who was an apprentice for a local company. So he was probably in his early 20s. And, and he would literally be dragging his heels the whole time. He'd be, if we're out on expedition, he'd be the one who was always moaning or he'd be the one that wasn't pulling his weight or, or didn't bring the thing that he was supposed to bring or was always just, just the one, the one that was just forever, um, making life difficult. Or we'd have review sessions and he would always be the one who was asking, um, questions that were more just to rile other people or just mm. not joining in. And I, I remember literally it was kind of about, about day four and he finally, something clicked and, and he realized that actually he could enjoy this and he could, he could actually be part of this. And I think he actually turned around to me and said, Oh, I get it now. And literally from that moment on, not surprising to me or anybody else, he became a really good leader because actually his, he was always, he was always a good leader, but he'd just been using it in the wrong way at the start of the week. And he'd been influencing other people by bringing people down. Whereas as soon as he flipped it and he realized that actually the opportunity he was getting was amazing. It, it was an expedition we'd been on and then we'd come back and we'd do climbing and there was some canoeing involved as well. Some various different things you had to work together. And um, there was one particular one where you have to, I don't know if you've seen where you strap um, canoes together to make a canoe raft and things yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I think he was he was maybe leading that one. I can't remember the exact details now, but I remember that that he finally flipped it round. And as soon as he flipped it round, it had this amazing impact on the rest of his group that he was working with because they maybe weren't actually the natural leaders. He was probably the natural leader of that group, mm. but until he actually switched on to 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 realizing. The, the benefits of being outdoors and the benefits of the things that he was doing with his colleagues. Once he did, they all had a much, much better time. So the last day was amazing. They had some big um, group project to do and they flew it. They flew. They really did really well. But up until that point where he was just adamant that he didn't want to be there and didn't want to do it and was just being a pain to everybody. <laughs> and then finally, he just literally said, turn around and said, Oh, I get it. And, uh, and I can't remember now. We must have had a discussion about what bit he got exactly. But um, but yeah, that, I do remember that one, and that yeah. he was typical of a few different people over the years who who just didn't didn't want to do it, and then you'd you'd have this sense as an instructor or as a tutor that you've just got to trust it, and you might finish a day completely shattered, and and yet you're doing um, evening reviews, and you're doing stuff to prepare for the next day, and you'd get waking up tired, and it's long days and long hours, and you've got this like few people who just bring a real pain. And, um, and then just trust the process, trust the mm. process, trust the process. And, you know, 9.9 times out of 10, you know, it would, it would all come out fine. And by the end of the, um, the week and that particular place I was working, they had a, they did a, um, uh, presentation at the end. So they would present to, they, these were apprentices. So they were early twenties, late teens, and they would then present to their, sort of heart, more superior people in the company and they would come in and they would watch them and see how they'd learned and what they'd done during the week. And they were always for us some of, as the instructors, some of the most satisfying times because although it's actually indoors at that moment, mm-hmm. you're watching people you work with all week reflect back uh, and standing up there sort of tall and proud as to what they've done that week. So, so yeah, mm-hmm. that's when, when they turn it around, you can tell that, that they're that they've done that at the end of a week if they haven't which is very very rare mm. and um they would stand up and it would be it'd be a real mess at the front but usually <laughs> when they're standing up and sort of describing everything they've done and i think that in that at that point they suddenly realize how much they've done that week as well mm. yeah yeah and i like it. what stands out to me is um not just the fact that people almost always have this moment of insight Mm-hmm. But also that it often happens on longer. Um, because it's, I, when I take people into the mountains with me or into nature with me, I always try to make it at least three or four days, mm-hmm. preferably five or something. Because, uh, and science has proved, has also uh, supported this, supports this by now that uh, you have to be in nature for about three days for your head to be, for to leave stuff that was causing you stress behind for you to clear your head and to be, to, to come to a place where you can actually be open to stuff that's happening where you are now instead of being in the past or in the, in the future somewhere. I like that. What is some of, uh, you've, li- you've worked in that space for quite some time. What is, what are some of the biggest lessons that you yourself took away from it before, uh, when you stepped out of that life? Good question. I think, so looking back on it, 
I mean, it taught me so much. Like, I, I was in the outdoor world for in, industry for for decades, for so many mm. years as a teenager, mm. all the way through. And I still, I still do bits of work now. So I guide on the hills still, mm. but it's in a different way. So what it taught me, I think, at the end of the day, is also that I needed to value my own um, engagement in the outdoors, if that makes sense. So that's finally what what caused me to leave it in the, in 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 the end. Because actually, I was finding I was taking people on adventures. I think somebody said to me one day, "Oh, it's amazing! You get to have adventures every day." And I kind of thought about it, and I was like, "No, actually, I don't. I get to take people on adventures mm. every day. Yeah. I'm not actually having an adventure every day." You know, what started as something that was viscerally in me that I I needed to do because it was that engaging in in nature and being outside once it came to the point where this is what I'm doing to pay my bills and then it was just this vicious circle of work to have a house to pay a bill to have the house to pay a bill and it's like well this is this isn't what I wanted when I started so I think ultimately what it taught me was balance because actually which is obviously in nature there's a whole whole load of balance in nature Mm -hmm. And, and it taught me so many life skills to be in it in the first place but it also taught me when it was time to prioritize myself and time to move away from it and time to look at life in a different way because when I was in my 20s when I'm teenager years when I'd gone into it in the first place you know I wasn't worried about having a house and paying the bills because I just lived wherever I worked or mm. and I lived out I lived out my car for a while there was 18 months where where the, the most common place I actually slept each night was my tent you know, so there was just things that weren't on my agenda like they are now. Mm-hmm. And I think it so it taught me so much about just um, not even not needing very much because I didn't really think of it at the time as as not needing very much. I just thought of it at the time as getting on with what I had. And actually, I had loads. But looking back on it, it taught me to to use my resources, really, I suppose, in, in whichever way. And then ultimately, as I say, it taught me it taught me the right time to step away from it and the right time to prioritize myself. And it's just in a different way. I just took just to slow life down a bit because it was, it was very high, wasn't high pace in terms of corporate world, but it was very intense in terms of having everybody's safety in terms yeah. of keeping up qualifications for all the difficult multi-activity. So mm-hmm. keeping up for climbing, for canoeing, for, and climbing was almost my original love. So yeah. that's what, that's what got me into it all in the first place was exploring and climbing. Um, and I realized that when I was being drawn more away from it, that, um, that it was time, yeah, it was time to, to prioritize myself. So, but I think, so that's kind of, that's one thing I've, I've learned from it. It's just that, that balance in life. Mm. But I think in, in what it actually taught me, it, well, it taught me a level of, of the, and again, it's jargon, but in terms of being organized, it, it taught me, you know, even camping skills as, as a kid going camping with the scouts sounds really crazy and the guides. That taught me a lot because it wasn't, you had to be really organized. You had to, you had to, if it rained, you had to put up the sides of the tent. You had to have, had to do your bedding roll in the morning. You know, all those simple things I think are often, are often have the biggest value because that sort of thing has stayed through with me now. Like just sort of being whatever I'm doing. I'm not always the most organized person. I can be very chaotic. My timekeeping is not brilliant. But underneath it all, I know where my own levels of comfort are and I can, you know, I can hold my own on the hill and, and all those sorts of things. Mm. And so even though I'm no longer really in it professionally, though I guide on the hill still, but I'm not doing the multi-activity stuff professionally. Um, it has, it has taught me just to be able to, I guess even in being in bad weather, it sounds really silly, but especially to being in the UK, it's, um, you know, it's often raining. I was working in Scotland for a lot. So there were midges, you know, little, little insects yeah. mm-hmm. around. And really they, they can be quite, um, very problematic. Yeah. And, um, you know, nightfall. So learning you know, to just to, to cope with even something silly, like being able to really silly, like being able to see in the dark, you know, like I guess if you've always lived in a town or a city, you, you've always had light. So you think of the darkness as maybe being something to be scared of or something mm. that you, you need to torch. Whereas actually the reality is, you know, you don't. So something as beautiful as that, I suppose, the outdoors taught me that actually you don't always need a light. You, you can, I guess you can be your own light, but you can, you know, you can, you, yeah. you don't actually, there's so much more than you might think that's inside you, if that makes sense. It, totally. Totally. I'm one of those people. I used to have a dog. My dog died mm-hmm. a couple of years ago, but I used to go out without a headlight or without a torch at night. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, because I'm like, 
when you start walking without those things, it's amazing what you can see. Mm, absolutely. Especially when the moon is out, you know, so there is no need for those things other than perhaps when somebody comes, you know, a, a car is driving behind mm-hmm. you or come and it's nice to be seen. But other than that, you know, when you go, uh, I try to walk without a torch or without a headlight when I'm hiking in the, and, uh, you know, an evening comes for as long as possible. And then when I think, okay, now I have to protect my ankles and whatever, it might be a good idea to see where I put my feet. That's when I turn it on. But otherwise I'm just walking in the dark. It's, I, I quite like it. And you see way more than you think. Yeah. It's definitely. good for your self confidence as well. Because uh, I don't know how many, you know, like you, I guide hikes as well. And um, I don't know how many people have asked me, are you going into the mountains by yourself? And I'm like, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, why wouldn't I? The, dang- mm-hmm. the most dangerous thing that can happen to me is that I run into a bull somewhere in mm-hmm. the, and otherwise, you know, every, everything else is more scared of me than I am of mm-hmm. them. And that scary guy that might that I might run into, who is going to hike three hours into the mountains in the hope of finding a lone female? Nobody. Exactly. So yeah. I'm probably more safe there in the dark than I'm anywhere else in the uh, in what we call civilization. Again, quotes. So you left uh, the outdoor space uh, apart from the guiding and whatever you're doing yourself, mm-hmm. just to be able to enjoy that, enjoy the outdoor space. Because I do mm-hmm. recognize that people are like, "Oh, you're on holiday all the time." <laughs> like, no, I'm not. <laughs> Like, oh, when I, oh, I, I just came back last week from, uh, from guiding to, uh, doing two guided treks. Um, and although I'm thoroughly enjoying it, I'm also very aware of the fact mm-hmm. that I'm responsible for all those people and I have to bring them back alive. So no, it's not a holiday. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you, you probably had been writing already, but you've made a career out of writing and you're writing a book as far yes. as I know. I'm writing two books, which is probably a bit foolish, but I am writing two books. Well, from what I've never tried it, people have said maybe I should, but I'm sort of in awe of people who do it and of the process they have to go through. So, yeah, two is perhaps a bit much to do that at the same mm-hmm. time. But tell us Not about it. Not recommended, but it's kind of what's happened. So. <laughs> so tell us, tell, tell us what are you doing in the writing world and uh, what are those two books about? So what I'm doing in the writing world at the moment, I set up a venture called Writing Inside Out, but that's come about through a whole host of reasons as to how that came about. So back in, I've always loved writing, always loved writing. My my mum died when I was a very young, well, not very young, I wasn't a young child, I was a young adult. So I was, I was 20, in my early 20s when my, my mum died. And I joined a, I think it, what do they call it then? It was a, um, the internet wasn't around. It was, uh, when you, I can't remember the word for it, but it's when your correspondence, your correspondence mm. course for writing. Mm. And I loved it, but I think I did about one. I, well, I'm not very good at finishing things sometimes. And, uh, and I did a really small part of it, but I loved it. And mm. I kept coming back to it, even though I, I was no longer corresponding. I was just doing the actual writing. I was no longer sending it off, but I really enjoyed it. And I started, um, a scene on that course of, of this particular girl and, and a dog, funnily enough. And I didn't, I didn't have a dog at that point. I had no desire to have a dog. We had a dog as kids, but, and it's actually interesting. I look back at my writing. My writing has got different dogs in it throughout the years. And now I have my own dog. So that's quite mm-hmm. funny. Um, so that's when it kind of, I was already doing sort of childish writing, if that makes sense. As in, I enjoyed it as a teenager and I enjoyed it as a child and I kept yeah. a diary, but I'd never really had thought about anything more than that. We did a few poems when I was a kid. And then thought, right, do the correspondence course. But then that didn't, other stuff was going on at that point in my life. And, and, and I didn't, didn't keep it going. And then I was always doing bits of writing. And then in about 2008, I think it was about then, I was, I was living in Scotland, but we were, we were going to be buying a house in, in Kendall. And again, at that point, I thought, I really, really want to change career. I want to get out of the outdoor multi activity industry. Cause by that point, I wanted to be more settled. Um, I'd, I'd really enjoyed it in the moment. I loved it, but actually I needed to, to spend a bit more time away at, at home away and, um, away from the work. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I thought, Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this break and I'm gonna, I'm gonna become a writer. I'm gonna take some time. 
And then what happened is we bought a house. <laughs> so then it was like, oh, we've got a mortgage, we've got bills, and I've got to be a grown up. So I thought, right, I'll stick with the outdoor industry, but in a new area, so in the Lake District. And at that point, that was just before the recession had hit. And I got loads of work in various places for that for that first year. And then and I still wanted to write, but it was it was kind of there a bit. And then after that first year, the recession hit. And because I was the first in all these amazing places that I was working, yeah. I was the I was first in, out. first out. Yeah. So suddenly, like there was no work and I had to go further away for work, ended up doing more expedition stuff as well. And, and the writing kind of got put on hold, but it was still there. It was still there. It was still there. And then I um, whole variety of things happened. Um, I had a, a very have had and am in an interesting uh, journey with fertility and motherhood. So I I, I don't have any um, earth side children. Um, mm-hmm. So so that's a massive part of me. And then so I guess to, to fast forward quite a few years, I I'd had um, a very traumatic miscarriage, and that part of me um, it 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 imploded me basically so I went from just about hanging on there in the outdoor industry not particularly enjoying the work anymore but I could do it so therefore I got up I got the work I went to the places and I did it and then I had the miscarriage and all of that just went I I no longer had um the, the mental reserves the physical capacity I just couldn't put that mask on anymore of getting up and doing the job that yes in the moment in the individual moment I enjoyed but as the bigger picture I couldn't do it mm. anymore and I, I li- literally got to say but physically I couldn't do it so that's kind of was the, the cutoff point and I still wanted to write and at that point I had joined a, an online writing group because by now you know online stuff was much more available than it was yeah. before and um and Long story short, I ended up taking over a writing group that I was a member of. And this was a, this happened like a couple of years later. Um, so the lady that I was, who was mentoring me, I was in her writing group and I ended up taking over her group for a whole variety of reasons. And then that's panned out to, to me then creating my own group in my own right. Um, which was originally called the, is called the Creative Writers Cabin. And that's an online writing group. Um, for people that want medium to long term support and then writing inside out is the kind of the bigger venture and that's come about since I thought right I'm actually going to really make a make really sort of put my efforts into and focus into this so by that point I already knew that I wasn't going back to the multi-activity stuff it just wasn't in me to do that but the guiding side of it picked up because that was working with adults and it was guiding on the the coast to coast route Mm. which is a route that goes from um, St. Bees in Cumbria across to Robin Hood's Bay in, in Yorkshire in, in north of England. So I was already guide. So I ended up guiding on that for the last, well, how many years ago, maybe five, six years that I started doing that. So it's much more recent in my outdoor career. And that had come about because my dad and I had done it in, 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 in stages. So therefore I, I'd learned the route and, and it li- all links in. So I was yeah. doing the guiding and then I was writing a book at this point, but that had this original character, this list girl and this dog, and it wasn't really going anywhere. And then, um, you know, this whole thing about write about what you know. So I thought, right, what do I know? Well, I know about the coast to coast and I know about quite a lot of emotional trauma. And I, you know, there's various things that I know about. So I thought, right, I'm just going to write a book about the coast to coast. So the, the current the book that I, so I'm writing a novel and the the in the novel is a character she's not me she absolutely isn't me but some of the emotions that she goes through I've tapped into my own emotions if that makes sense and she's a girl called Amy and she she lives down in the south of England and she is absolutely clueless about the outdoors so she doesn't know how to you know doesn't even have walking boots doesn't have anything doesn't even have a walking jacket doesn't you know wouldn't have a clue how to navigate herself across you know the the hills and the fells and she ends up doing the coast to coast so the novel is about her experiences of being this you know fairly incompetent to begin with person doing the coast to coast and then how she experiences it along the way and um and the person she was supposed to be starting it with uh that there's a there's an issue there and there's some some traumas and things so it's basic but that that's her so she is walking across the coast to coast and it basically because i really wanted to to, to show, I mean, the coast to coast route anyway showcases Northern England's beautiful, beautiful countryside. And, um, and I kind of in this novel, I guess I wanted to do that as well. So it's partly her 
human relationships, but a lot of it is her relationship with it. He, she heals along the way. So she's had all these traumas that are, they're not my traumas, they're her own traumas. Mm-hmm. Um, but she is healing along the way. And, and part, a big part of that is the, the people she meets, but a big part of that is just her engagement with this route and it's that sense of it takes her a very long time it's it's a two-week walk it takes her much much longer to do it for various reasons but it's that sense of of journeying and you kind of journey within you journey without and it's definitely something that I've seen in the people that I work with guiding is you, you start on day one and and you know by the end of the two weeks they are they're often you know quite high flying corporate people and actually by the end of it they're much calmer they are you know they're a slower pace of life and and really enjoying it yeah. um and so it's, it's kind of that that brings it out of you that that kind of experience so that's one of the books that i'm writing and then as time kind of moved on and writing inside out um came about and that whole idea is that it's the the outdoor side of it as as well as being you know indoors and writing but mm-hmm. i very much encourage people to get out in nature and to write outside as well but then it's that sense of what is inside us needing to come out as well. So it's the inside and the outside. And sometimes it can just be journaling. So sometimes it is, it's what's inside me and it needs to come out onto the page or the people that I'm working with, people that I'm coaching. It's to encourage people to write for themselves, not necessarily to write for other people, just to write what's coming out. But then there's that extra step of the inside out being, this is my voice and my words or whoever I'm working with, their voice and their words. And then encouraging and empowering people to then write for the outside world or for just yeah. somebody else to read, whether it's showing that to one person or whether that's writing a Facebook post or whether that's actually writing a book. So the whole writing inside out operates on quite a few different levels. Um, and then so the second book that I'm writing kind of that is it often this thing that people say is that there's a book that has to come first. And this second book is really my book that has to come first because my miscarriage was in 2005 and it's taken me quite a few years to try. I had a relationship breakdown at the end of all of that as well. So a whole like life just completely imploded. And, and it was about unpicking that. And to begin with, I did a lot of writing. I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote as a way of me processing my own experiences. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then it kind of got to the stage where I thought I was going to write a book that was to help people through miscarriage. And it never really happened. It just didn't happen. That wasn't, that wasn't the book. That is, that isn't and wasn't the book I'm supposed to write. Mm. So the book I am writing is called At the Crossroads Exploring Motherhood because actually where I am at is looking at the, um, if what you do when you have had a fertility journey that hasn't resulted in you having your own children around you uh, and what the you know sometimes what the um pragmatic options are what, how the emotions feed into that all the different parallel lives you can live on especially if you are actively in a fertility journey so you've got that sort of trying to have a family but the reality mm-hmm. is you don't so there's parallel lives and and it's a whole variety of things so that's the that's almost the book that has to come first. So that's that's the that's my sort of personal story book that I'm yeah. writing alongside the, the novel. And and uh, yeah, they take and dive like the you know, like writing does. And a lot of it is since I've been ironically since I have been um, working with other people in the creative writers cabin and through writing inside out. There's been less time to do my own writing. So that just comes down to my own management and my mm. own. Um, uh what would you say my own feeling that yes these books can be written and of course that is obviously what I am you know empowering other people to do as well that actually their words are important and the world kind of you know needs to hear their words in a different way but it's lovely when I see people that I've worked with um supporting them writing blogs where you know I'm, I'm helping them through and some of the work that I do is 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 the empowerment but some of it is also actually looking at the writing and looking at how we can tighten the writing or restructure it or or pull things out or put more things in or or elevate it or layer it with the senses and things like that yeah. so it's lovely when I then see people who I've been working with and I see their writing come to life and their writing get published or their blog uh, go out and that that's really lovely when I see that Mm, yeah, I can imagine. Your books sound amazing. Thank you. Yeah. And I can, and, and especially the one that needs to come first. I don't, it sounds like, um, 
that is not an easy one to write because you have to go back into whatever it is that you experienced at that particular time mm-hmm. to put it on paper. And the first one is my kind of book. You know, I love books like that. Mm-hmm. It? So, um, you know, let me know when they come out. I will do. <laughs> because, and if you need a proofreader, you know, I'm oh, here. <laughs> brilliant. Thank you. I might so, take you up on that. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I, any book that is about um, somebody that walks from A to B and, and, you know, goes on a journey, not just from A to B, but on an internal journey as well, um, is one that I like. There's very few that I've read that I was like, well, good Lord, you know. <laughs> no, so I look forward to them. Um, I want to be conscious of our time together. So I'm going to ask you the three questions mm-hmm. I ask of everyone that is a guest on this podcast. And it's all about um, favorites that celebrate nature. Um, as we were talking about books, what is, do you have a favorite book that celebrates nature? So I, this is really interesting when you sent me these questions and, and I have lots of different books I've read. I am the world's, I say worst, world's best person at forgetting titles, to be honest, which is ironic <laughs> given that I love writing. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the one book that, I, that really sticks with me is called The Salt Path by Raina Wynn. And it's, it's um, a personal memoir type personal story. And it's about a lady who, again, it's a long journey and she has this most amazing experience of her herself and her husband who who were living a quote normal life you know with a you know a a house and 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 belongings and things Mm -hmm. and and basically everything gets repossessed and for a whole variety of reasons I think they that she doesn't go into massively but some some business deal that's Mm -hmm. gone gone wrong and um and basically the whole book is then about hers and her husband's moth's interact interaction with then suddenly having a tent and rucksacks and he's he's really not very well he's not a well man at all and they they just set off walking and it's basically the healing power and this book came out well after i started writing you know the coast to coast because it's uh, the the one step forward which is my Mm -hmm. book about the coast to coast and um and it just resonates with me so much is that sense of walking and that sense of journeying internally and externally and and some of the sort of the the environmental um interactions they have along the way whether it's with birds whether it's with just the the air like literally like breathing and being in a tent and living outdoors and waking up and the air is on your face you know that is just one of the most amazing things um so that's that's my book so mm-hmm. the Salt path by Raina Wynn. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I've heard of it. I haven't read it yet. Mm, so it's, uh, I'd rather re- recommend it. She's re- she's written a second one, mm-hmm. and the second one is good. Um, and the second one probably looks even more at nature. Mm-hmm. But I, for me, the first one is just is so special, so so special. She okay. she was in such a raw place when she started that walk, and she wrote the book never with an intention of publishing it. She just wrote the book for her husband Moth, whose um, whose memory is going for for mm. a variety, variety of reasons with his illness, and she wrote it so that he could remember their walk. And then I think her family, her children, so adult children, saw it or read it, and they encouraged her to to you know to to actually get it properly okay. published. Mm, it's an amazing that. story. Right, a piece of music. That celebrates nature. So this is what I'm I'm not sure if this counts. So I was thinking of different things. And I was like, it's not technically a piece of music I have. It's technically not really a piece of music at all. But I really like the song Singing in the Rain. You know, so when you're... you're, Because, and again, on so many... When it's raining and I'm out walking my dog, Millie, because... I love Melita Bit, so let's mm-hmm. face it, she has to be walked, whatever the weather. Mm-hmm. And why not? I just, I find myself, and I live in Cumbria, so although technically where I live at the moment is not as wet as where I used to live, but um, and when it rains, I just literally find myself singing, I'm singing in the rain. <laughs> da, 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 I do that. And I love it. And I was just like, so when I saw your question, I was trying to think of all these songs, and I was like, I'm, I don't. I can't think of any because I'm rubbish at thinking of titles. And and there, I'll probably finish this, and I'll find so many different songs this mm. week that I could have answered you with. Mm-hmm. But you know, the one that just kept coming back in was "I'm singing in the rain" or "Singing in the rain." And oh, I just, no, I'm going to say that one. It's, 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 yeah, I love that song. And, and, you know, I'm a really big 
musical fan, especially of that era. It's, okay. you know, it's uh, Gene Kelly and Debbie mm-hmm. Reynolds and Donald O'Connor. Um, which, you know, the fact that I, that I know these people tells you that I'm a big musical fan. Yeah, so I love great. that. And like you, especially when I'm guiding a group and that mm-hmm. group gets all, you know, down in the dumps mm-hmm. because it's raining and it's going to be raining for the next couple mm-hmm. of hours and we're, you know, we'll have to walk through it because we have to go <laughs> from A to B. At some point I start singing. Yeah. Cause, you know, it's, it, I found it lifts my spirits and when my spirits are up, the chances of their spirits Definitely. coming up are also bigger. Definitely. So, you know, and I don't mind making a fool of myself when I'm doing yeah. that. And, so, you and know, you're right, in the rain, it's like, you know, when you're working outside and people say, are we going to walk and it's raining? Uh, yes. <laughs> you know, there's very few, okay, there are occasionally times when we, we have to pull out something because of the weather, but it, yeah. use that threat, threat of lightning strike or ridiculous gale force wind. It's not because exactly. it's raining. <laughs> no, no, rain is, it's that old saying, there's no thing, no such thing as bad weather. There's only bad totally. clothing. Yeah. 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 So, okay, final one. Um, a what did I ask? Music. Oh yeah. Um a favorite movie that celebrates nature. So do you know what? And I was again, I was thinking and thinking and thinking, and I'm not a massive film person, and that's mainly because I've fallen asleep. It's not that I don't enjoy them. <laughs> I somehow watching a film makes me fall asleep. Mm-hmm. So it's a slight cop-out answer, but I like any film that has really lovely scenery in it. And that is a, it is a cop out, but I, any, it can be the worst film in the world, but if it has lovely scenery, mm. then I really like it. Um, and again, I think it's just because of that visceral reaction to seeing green or seeing mountains or, yeah. or water or something like that. Um, so it isn't one specific film, but it's any film that I can be watching or, or even like a TV series where it's set somewhere that the storyline might be really sort of you know, nothing to do with being outdoors, mm-hmm. but it's set somewhere beautiful. So yeah. there's been a couple up here where we might have like a crime drama and it's set, um, I know Morecambe Bay or somewhere. So you've got the beautiful sea and you've got, and you've got the hills in the distance. Or there was one about, um, it, again, it's a TV series rather than a film, but, um, a, a young lad who's autistic. And mm. that's set in the Lake District. So you've got this amazing story unfolding, but it's against yeah. the backdrop of beautiful mountains. And there's this crazy character, this granddad who goes fell running and things like that. So anything like that, mm. I really like watching. Yeah. So it might not overtly be about nature, but, um, but it is, it's filling me up just watching it. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. I've, you know, I've been to the movies and, um, with friends and they were like, Oh my God, this movie was so amazing. And I'm like, yeah, the music was really good. And I love the country, the photography of the countryside and everything. Mm-hmm. The story. Meh. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I get that. Yeah. Okay. One final question that I haven't prepared you for. So oh, okay. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> what is one thing that the listeners can do for themselves to, um, to get better at leading themselves, but perhaps also enjoy nature while doing that. Okay. So I think there's two things that I would Ooh. say to that. Mm-hmm. And they are, they are linked. So I, I think the, for, the first I did sense is that knowing that everyone already has inside what they need, that there's nothing extra. Yes, we can learn new things, but it's that sense that what is inside us is, is everything we need. It's just untapping it. Mm-hmm. And, and so the simple thing I think is to take that time to go for a walk outside. Now, whether that is outside, like I can drive and I could go into the Lake District, which is amazing, or whether that's walking to the park or whether that is walking the dog or whatever it's doing, but taking some time outside where you don't take your phone. You, you may have one particular, um, you know, question you're mulling over, or it may be that you just want a, a bit of a, a space out, but just to go outside to get up from the desk to, to just go somewhere different or put your mind somewhere differently. Mm-hmm. And then when you come back from that walk, or even better, take it with you, take a notebook with you and then just literally start writing. And for me, it sounds really, it sounds really, really simple. But if you start writing, 
Um, and, and it's something, I know something like, you know, for, for me to untap my leadership, it would be, and then dot, 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 or some, something else, and then just start writing and start writing and just see what comes up. So I think in terms of, um, and that is because I'm a writer and that is because that's my kind of one of my go-to places. Yeah. But I, I would say for me over the years, I have uncovered so much about myself because of writing, because of journaling, because of just literally putting onto the page how I'm feeling in that moment mm-hmm. and using it to, to process what either I'm going through or what I'm going to do next even. And, and it's that sense of, um, of not, of somebody else not having the answers. It's just that the answers are, in me and I'm then open to being inspired by other people. Yeah. So then and then I can write that out of me if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So that that would totally. be my, my top tip. So a walk it could be a, could be could be go for two weeks near the coast to coast. Or it could be like go for half an hour or five minutes or just just draw a breath. Um yeah. and then and then just know that whatever it is that you need to be doing next, that you you've got it, you've got it inside. Great tip. Thank you for being with, with us. Thank you for, for doing this. Thank you very much for having me. It's been been fun. Good. You've been listening to Daring Self Leadership and the Nature Connection. You can find the show notes for this episode and every other one on the podcast page on the Dare Greatly Coaching website. The podcast is available wherever you like to listen and it's hosted by me, Gerdy Verwoerd. The music is Butt Bursting by Poddington Bear. Thank you for being with me today. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode. And in the meantime, as always, go there greatly.